the head. Through it we see, we speak, we hear. The shell that encloses the brain. On that shell we place the halo, the symbols of power, be they crowns, plumes or thorns. Some primitive people considered the skull in terms of power. They thought it contained the soul, the all-living, the never-dying. Even stripped of its trappings, they say, man's virtue is still trapped inside. Capture it and you capture the spirit of the dead. When the Romans first came to Britain, they were appalled to find headhunters. So far back in our history that we've almost forgotten all about it. But there are parts of the world where warriors still proudly display their trophies. The skulls of buffaloes and men are symbols of success. Severed heads, proof of virility. Charms that bring fertility to women, to cattle and to crops. Here in the hills of India, wedged between Assam and Burma, the Naga people live in much the same sort of way as our ancestors did before the coming of the Romans. Their houses simple, their farming primitive. Seeing them today, we can get a fair idea of what happened in our country as man took the first tentative steps towards progress. In Britain, this happened before history was being written down, but the progress of the Nagas has been watched and recorded by both Britain and India. The notoriety of the Nagas as headhunters has kept them remote. So too have the difficulties of communication. Their hills have natural barricades. The forests and the fast rivers enclose them, protect them. Their enemies were their next door neighbors. The men in the next village were the only invaders, taking land, taking heads. The rivers could be forded during the dry season, but for the rest of the year, the Nagas built rough bridges of cane and bamboo. Very fragile constructions, easily destroyed should any village feel itself threatened by hostile neighbors. As another line of defense, the forests between the villages were planted with man traps, small bamboo spikes called panjis that pierced the feet. There were trip strings that released poisoned arrows into the victim's ribs, or he might fall into a concealed pit full of large pointed poles. The British started to explore this difficult and dangerous area in the 1830s, but didn't administer it until the 80s. As late as 1936, there were still blank spaces on the map of Nagaland, and in the unadministered territory, officials had to have military escorts. So only part of the Naga hills came under British control. In remoter regions, the headhunters' trophies swung over the houses, proclaiming the strength and the fertility of the people. After Indian independence, the Nagas demanded their freedom. In the years of unrest and rebellion that followed, the Indian government built jeep tracks for the army, and in 1963, Nagaland was made an independent state in the Indian Union. Some Nagas carried on fighting for complete independence without success. Nagaland lies in a politically sensitive area, not far from China, Burma, and Pakistan. To strengthen this northeastern frontier, the Indian government has been pouring in money, and today, the half million Nagas enjoy a comparatively high standard of living. They've suddenly come face to face with the ways of the modern world. But even so, Nagaland is still closed to foreigners. The first Western observer to be allowed in for some years was Professor Christoph von Führer Heimendorf, a London anthropologist. He originally made contact with them in 1936. The first group of Nagas he met on his return seemed to have changed very little. The brass trophies of the headhunters still glint on their chests. 
In days gone by, a party of travellers would have had quite a different welcome. But these days, they're happy to accept a cigarette and allow the traveller to pass. My return to the Nagas, and particularly to the village of Wokching, was a moving experience. Thirty-four years had passed since I had first fallen under the spell of the gaiety and the friendliness of these attractive people. During the twelve months I had then spent with them, I had shed many of the inhibitions and prejudices of the Western world, and I had learned to share their simple pleasures and to relax in the company of friends. As I approached Wokching, I found the news of my arrival had travelled ahead of me. A large crowd awaited me. Sadly, some of my closest friends had died, but others were alive, and many who had been children when I first stayed at Wokching gave me a warm welcome. They did not hide their surprise at my return. It is like a dream to see you alive, they told me again and again. We were sure you must be in the land of the dead. The road to the land of the dead lies over the mountains, then underground to a mythical place called Yimbu. There the souls live on as they did in this world, while the man's body is left behind in a burial hut, protected by skulls of buffaloes he sacrificed in his lifetime. The skulls of ancestors stand guard, while the heads of his enemies still play a central part in village life. The old man can remember from which village each head was captured, and there were no rules about fair fights. These were once living children, old men walking in the forest, and women collecting water from the well. Powerful forces cling to these skulls. They're fed with rice beer, so their spirit revisits the village, giving the people strength and fertility. When the heads were brought back in triumph, there was a victory dance. The men would boast of being as fierce as tigers, as mighty as the clouds that thunder and hurl down fireballs. Capturing a head gave a man prestige. It proved his virility. And after the dancing came the tattooing. Body tattoos meant he'd been present on a raid, while one on his neck and face meant he'd actually cut off a head. The women's admiration of the headhunters took the form of imitation. Tattooing was fashionable, but it's no fun to have holes hammered in your legs with an ads-like instrument made of thorns. And the blue dye is based on soot. The girls put on a brave show for the camera, but it's a very painful process. The Naga women used to taunt young men who didn't wear the tattoos of a warrior. So before a man could marry, he had to go headhunting. The last reported case of headhunting in the Naga Hills was in March 1970, and the men still carry spears wherever they go. The young men guard the women and children on their long trek down to work in the fields. The settlements are all on the tops of the hills. The Nagas made their villages into natural fortresses against their enemies, their neighbours. Their rice crops grow a thousand feet down in the fertile valleys. Traditionally, the women and old men work while the young men stand guard. But as the threat of headhunters attacking gets less, this is dying out, and the young men work too. The Nagas managed to produce their food with very simple tools. Cut off from the developments of the rest of the world, they know little about modern implements. In their system of shifting agriculture, they clear the forest, burn, and cultivate. When the soil's exhausted, they pass on. For the Nagas, it's still a communal effort, a time for getting together, for gossip, and for singing.
as the rice is gathered, it has to be carried up to the village the same day, a reminder of the times when no one in the Naga Hills could trust a neighbour. All day long, the human conveyor belt moves slowly up the steep hill to the villages, still carrying arms, another reminder of more violent times. Although the Nagas cooking is primitive, they're well fed and the food is good. We have chickens and marrow. Rice is prepared in a hollow bamboo. The boys bounce and swing, beating the rice off the stalks, a game with a purpose. By the end of the day, every grain of rice will be stored in the village. They've all turned out to clear the field, and although they're exhausted, it's worth it if the crop is safe from their neighbours. The rice is put straight into the granary. The door doesn't need a lock. The Nagas have a simpler idea. A heavy, cumbersome bolt. The whole village would wake if it were shot back in the night. And as a further precaution against thieves, the young people are encouraged to sleep together on the veranda outside the granary door. When a girl is ready to take a lover, her parents advertise the fact by giving her brass earrings, and she blackens her teeth to make herself more attractive. At the same age, the boys move into the men's house. This is a barrack for the warriors and a meeting place for all the men of the village. It used to be the most important building, and although it's no longer the focal point of village life, it still houses the finest carvings. These girls of 12 and upwards live in a permissive society. Their parents don't object to their having lovers before marriage. The 
The boys and girls never dance together, but Naga society is geared towards letting them experiment with sex and enjoying it while they're very young. There are few of the worries and none of the crimes that often accompany sex in more civilized parts of the world. And the girls rarely become pregnant, a phenomenon common among primitive people. The girls have about five years of low fertility after puberty. They settle down when they're about 17 and their marriages are usually stable and happy. And there's no prudery. Everyone washes at the same well. The girls stay in a group because the well is some distance from the village. It used to be a favorite place for headhunters to pick off solitary women. The drinking water is collected in bamboo. The constant exercise of lifting and carrying keeps the Naga girls slim, graceful, and fitter than any organized PT. The exercises, the uniforms, and the song are all remains of the British influence in this part of the world. When the British left Nagaland, there was one high school and some missionary schools in the villages. Now there are three colleges, 31 high schools, 144 middle schools, 800 primary schools, and boarding facilities for children from the distant hills. And they can go on to Indian universities. Last year, the first Naga obtained his PhD. But such is progress. One day, educated men like this won't find jobs back in the villages. Originally, the Naga tribes had no common language. And in primary schools, the children used a composite language called Naga Assamese. The official language is English, and now 27% of the Nagas are literate. In one generation, the Nagas have made enormous strides, enormous progress in a changing world. The girls in school now have the same chances as the boys, which is more than they do in the villages. There, if there's heavy work to be done, it's the girls who do it. The Nagas love dressing up, but it's the men who spend hours titivating and parading like peacocks, especially when they're young. This old lady is the widow of Mao Wang, the late chief of the village. I knew him and his wives very well. She was pleased and excited to see me, but he unfortunately had died some two years ago. He had been the undisputed leader of the village, a chief of the purest blood, and under his rule, this village was pulsating with vitality. Frequent feasts and rituals were the occasion for colorful ceremonials. The photographs which I had brought showed the chief in the splendid attire which he and other men in the village used to wear on festive occasions. All this has been changed by the people's conversion to Christianity, and within one generation, an admirable way of life has vanished.
The elders still gather outside the chief's house to consider the omens before making any important decisions. According to how the bamboo splits in the heat, they will choose a site for the new fields for next year's rice crop. Although the younger men look a bit skeptical, these rituals still play an important role in remote villages. The children laugh and joke as a procession forms, a funeral procession. Recently, the Nagas adapted their funeral service to Christian ideas, but they have managed to keep the spirit of the occasion unaltered. After all, death is nothing to be feared. The dead man's soul lives on in the next world, and his skull will stay here, an asset to the village. The Christians introduced the hymn book into the hands of the man leading the procession, and they stopped the Nagas leaving bodies in the open. In the old days, the corpses were placed on platforms in the middle of the village. Only when they had decomposed was the head wrenched off and kept while the rest of the skeleton was allowed to moulder away anywhere. Now they are hygienically buried, and to keep the dead man company, they sacrifice a dog. <laughs> The whole occasion is a curious mixture of Western religion and the old pagan beliefs. The burial hut is traditionally erected round the grave, and now the man's soul can set out on its journey to the land over the mountains. All the vanity of the Nagas is expressed in their full ceremonial dress. It was never worn in battle, only at the victory dance afterwards. The bracelets and necklaces are their wealth. The tusks and teeth on their headdresses represent boar and tigers killed while the brass heads show how many men they've killed. Today, Nobody can boast of his tiger-like fierceness or carry his enemy's head on his spear. It's just dressing up. The Indian government encourages them to keep the picturesque parts of their culture. The Nagas have learned to enjoy security. The days of glory are gone and few want them to return. Like most civilizations, they express their warlike instincts in other ways. We have military tattoos and international football. The Nagas relive headhunting, the ambush and the kill as a formal dance. My departure from Nagaland was by jeep, the novel means of transport which had enabled me to visit a large number of villages within a very short time. 
but travelling on jeep tracks one is often confronted with unexpected obstacles. Here our way was blocked by trees felled by a storm. We would have been held up indefinitely had it not been for the helpfulness of a group of Nagas who were returning from the fields and came to our assistance. Within half an hour they had cleared the track and so we were safe the unpleasant experience of spending a night in the forest. In the plains at the edge of Naga land, we came across a group of cognac Nagas fishing in a lake. These were men whose forefathers had migrated to Assam. In the hills, Nagas poison fish, but here they have adopted the techniques of the fishermen of the lowlands. I was now heading towards the hills north of the Brahmaputra, an area included within the Northeast Frontier Agency where I had been working during the Second World War. Anyone traveling in Assam has to cross numerous rivers, and though recent years saw the construction of many bridges, ferries are still the most common way of carrying people and vehicles across. Thirty years ago, such rivers presented much more formidable obstacles, and at that time I had crossed many of them on makeshift rafts. In this largely unexplored tribal country south of the Tibetan border, I had to travel with large bands of porters. Here the tribesmen had lived for centuries in almost total isolation, and the valley was a kind of Shangri-La. The Apatani Valley is 5,000 feet up, the land is rich and fertile, and the people live in large villages. They're surrounded by neat fields of rice and clusters of fruit trees. The cattle, domesticated bison, called mitan, found only in northeast India. The Apatanis are very conscious of the value of property. They build houses close together, and every scrap of land is used to the full. Like the Nagas, the Apatanis' worst enemies are their neighbors, and any disputes are traditionally settled by discussion. Both quarrels within the tribe and disputes with outsiders are often resolved by negotiation and the Apatanis have a system of public debates. The litigants argue their points volubly and with many dramatic gestures. To mark the cattle or valuables at issue, they use bamboo sticks as tallies, laying them out in a line as they speak. In intertribal disputes, the threat of force was ever present. When I first lived among the Apatanis, I became witness of a raid against a village of Daflas. They were holding up Patanis to ransom, rather like modern kidnappers. The Dafla village was burned, but there was no loss of life in this raid, and the houses could be rebuilt within a few weeks. Even that dispute was ultimately resolved by negotiations. Today, similar scenes can be seen quite often. Although money is now widely used, payments, are sometimes still made in salt. The housewives stand around and gossip. The pipe's unusual, but this woman could be in a backyard in any town, anywhere which is remarkable when we consider that they've been completely out of touch with the rest of the world. And 25 years ago, they hadn't even seen a wheel. Work starts early, and their industriousness has turned this valley into a garden where nothing's wasted.
but the work is still done by hand. They don't make any everyday use of the newfangled wheel. The ground is still flattened with sledges and then made into terraces before the rice is planted. But in spite of the Apatani's energy, human effort isn't enough. The gods of the field must be encouraged to watch over the progress of the crops. So the priest offers an egg, a symbol of fertility, and rice at a makeshift altar. The lower class Apatanis used to be virtually slaves. They weren't badly treated, but it was very difficult for them to become free and independent. The animals are never milked or put out to work. They're allowed to roam the jungle until it's their turn to be sacrificed. The spring festival, a time for ceremony, and the concerted effort of the whole village helps repair the assembly platform. As many cattle as a rich man can spare are brought into the village to be sacrificed. Planks are carved from tree trunks and dragged into place. The cattle are tied to the base of the platform and the Apatanis feed them salt. This is the only way of making the huge animals manageable. For roaming most of the time in the jungle, they have no other contact with their owners. <laughs> Like any priest, this man is the Apatani's link with the gods and spirits that rule their lives. They keep him refreshed with mugs of rice beer while he calls on the gods to accept the sacrifice. After the chicken has been ritually beheaded, it's slit open, and from its liver and stomach, the priest can tell whether the omens for the crop are good or bad. The meat is cut up into joints, which are given to all those taking part in the sacrifice. There's no waste. It's not thought that the gods want the whole beast. As long as it's slaughtered in the ritual way, they have the spirit of it, and the Apatanis have the meat. The priest always gets the biggest share. <laughs> The more meat a man can give away, the higher his standing in the village. The Apatanis always share. At festival time, the women of the rich man's family hand out rice beer to everyone in the village in order of importance. A man can't impress his neighbors with the size of his car or his foreign holidays, but he can outdo his rivals in hospitality. He's judged by the parties he gives. <laughs> poles or masts sprout in the Apatani villages and they take it in turns to decorate them for the spring festival. 
After the ceremony, the sacrifice, the eating and the drinking, these masks provide the entertainment. It's left to the young men to celebrate the coming of spring. The ropes from the mast to the ground are made of long canes. Two young men bounce on the rope until it's got enough momentum to carry one of them high into the air for a display of aerial acrobatics. <laughs> children get bored with watching and play in the streets. They've made the football out of a pig's bladder. All the Apatonis seem to have plenty of energy. They eat well, the air's good, and anyone on an errand goes about it briskly. They move purposefully, looking neither to left nor right, carrying all their goods on their back. Very often they break into a trot, just as if they had a train to catch. fast to keep up with the changes in their valley. The Apatanis have met many outsiders since their contact with Professor Heimendorf less than 30 years ago. The young people know when they're being photographed. The old men don't care about such things. But already they're self-conscious, aware of the curiosity of foreigners. They do have one of the problems facing the rest of India today, overcrowding. More children survive infancy and they're outgrowing their village. There's no more land for farming, the village is jam-packed full of houses and some Apatanis now commute at the trot or by jeep to the nearest town. The road may be rough but at the end of it there are new opportunities. There's work in the offices, there's the headquarters of the Subansiri district, 
There are houses and there are shops. There's also a school. Like the Nagas, the children are being educated. There's even an Apatani pilot in the Indian Air Force. A cinema too is to be found in the town, showing Indian films. And the first Apatani shopkeeper. Paddy Layang, whom in 1944 I knew as a daring war leader, is now a prosperous businessman. He owns a truck and two shops, and one of his sons runs a bakery, unheard of a generation ago. Young Apatanis drive their own trucks along the road cutting through the densely wooded foothills. And here, as elsewhere, two systems of transport meet. The men and women carrying heavy baskets represent the old days and the young lorry drivers the future. These people on foot are daflas from villages lying in the hills above the road. Before the construction of roads and bridges, turbulent rivers rushing through the valleys of the foothills used to impede communications between the tribesmen and the outside world. They, who 25 years ago had never seen even a wheel, now accept the modern traffic as a matter of course. Like other businessmen coming to the market, the young Apatanis now frequent restaurants and sit at tables in the western manner. They are still recognizable by their hairstyle, but otherwise dress in modern fashion. People from the hills mingle in the markets of many towns with Indian plains people. What begins as an exchange of products leads ultimately to many forms of cultural and social interaction. The celebrations of Indian Independence Day in Haflong show the revolutionary change in attitude. The Nagas and the Apatanis come down to the plains with their once feared neighbors. Their loyalties have widened. It's no longer the clan and the village that are the only group to which they belong, but a district, a country, a continent. The Indian minister taking the parade is from one of the hill tribes himself. Somehow the whole occasion still has a British flavour. The Nagas have seen foreigners come and go. Back in the village there are still reminders of British rule. The ruins of a British bungalow crumbles back into the land. But the old British district headquarters is spick and span, well looked after by the Indian commissioner. A 
And with the British came the Christian missionaries who built churches at the centre of the communities. Headhunting appalled the missionaries and they buried this village's collection of heads in a traditional Christian grave. But the headstone is a satisfying and familiar symbol to the Nagas. Stone tallies hidden in the rice mark the 64 women in this particular man's life. His wife merits a larger tally. Stones represent the number of human heads captured and held in the village through its history. They mark the number of buffalo sacrificed, as do the skulls bleaching on the hillside. Tallies were records of triumph, so medals were one part of British culture that the Nagas accepted happily. But this man took an office job at headquarters. The easy life has made him fat. In the village, this old man is thin. His medals are memories of the glorious fights of his youth. He mimes his bravery and daring when he killed tigers with spears and daggers. But it all happened so long ago, the ants have eaten the stuffing out of the tiger and its remains are just an empty shell. The old man will find nothing to replace these long lost excitements and these children will never know them. The Indian government encourages them to remember their traditional dances, but already they've got it wrong. And their Indian school friends aren't really interested. The young Naga's excitements will just be the competitive struggles of all educated people. They'll be safer and richer than their parents. But there's a gap in their culture. They're the children of headhunters, and they know little of the rituals that made men proud to belong to their village and lent them great dignity. What will the Nagas do with their headhunting past?